All right, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Colonel George Doherty from the Air Force Research Laboratory. I'm the mobilization assistant to the commander. And uh, you know, we've heard a lot of great uh, material this morning, and especially uh, John Antall's great lead-in talk, talking about how the, the character of warfare is changing, if we didn't need any more evidence of that. And what we're going to be talking about here is how do we move beyond the reactive mode of, of uh, you know, of being concerned about what we see happening in other parts of the world and what it means for us. And how do we flip that script to start saying, you know, where we want to be, which is how to get the rest of the world wringing their hands about the changes that are happening here and what it's going to mean for them. So this talk is on uh, a new emerging conceptual framework. You know, I am from the Air Force. I think uh, you know, we've got a lot of activity happening and you know, how the uh, robotics revolution and so forth is going to change of just where technology is taking us and think about the emerging conceptual frameworks that allow us to think a few steps ahead and get back into the business we used to be in in the U.S. military of rethinking how we go to war and reinventing ourselves in a way that keeps us a full generation ahead of our adversaries. So joint Force design is becoming a joint, a, a clear priority again. And that means looking not just at s and and new concepts as, a, as answering demand signals that come from today's operations and operators and saying, what do we need a better version of to fit into this capability, right? We're not taking new ideas, new technologies and slotting them into our existing operations to help make them better. We're looking at how can we move beyond the way we're doing things today to, uh, to come up with new joint concepts that can change the Air Force uh, futures, looking at future concepts. And I, uh, you know, I, even though I'm from the Air Force and I have parochial pride, I don't think I'm uh, missed to say that I think the Army is one, at least a half a step ahead of us. We actually took, tried to take pages from the Army's playbook with uh, our ARCIC and, and then with the, uh, the Army Futures Command to try to get after combining these things. But I think that there's some a real pride in, in what the Maneuver Center has been doing. And we'll talk about a few of those things. And Colonel Ryan, after me, will talk about a few of the things that uh, the specific programs that are getting after some of the concepts that we're talking about here. But the key question is this, you know, what entirely new operational concepts for the future force could be enabled by robotic and, an, and autonomous systems, right? Looking back, you know, what are the fundamental characteristics that they enable us to do? And how could we fully leverage and grasp those fundamental new capabilities? And and that's a capability that the U.S. has really enjoyed almost a monopoly on for the past 30 years. But because of the proliferation of robotic and autonomous systems, it's becoming table stakes now, right? And so there's a lot of pressure to say, what do we do to maintain our overmatch? But there has been much less uh, innovation in close combat in the ground domain, right? Now, this is in the domain which really, you know, as we've learned over the past couple of decades, you know, uh, as uh, General Donahoe said this morning, you can fly over the terrain, you can bomb it, but ultimately, you know, your victory only comes when you put your men and women uh, in the dirt. That is to say, Ultimately, you have to win close combat in the ground domain if you're going to actually prevail in the conflict. And there has been next to no transformational innovation in the ground domain, probably since the era of the big five weapon systems and the onset of uh, um, a night vision, say, in the, in the 1970s, 1980s. There's been a lot of new technology, right? But it hasn't really fundamentally changed. going forward, not only current conflicts, but maybe future gray zone conflicts and all the complex things we expect to see, including in the Pacific, right? You've got mega cities and, uh, uh, you know, the expectation is that urban operations will become this century's signature form of warfare. Operating in those complex environments is going to be very key. Now, both the Air Force and the Army and the Navy as well have been put, pouring a lot of efforts into robotics and autonomy because they offer uh, you know, very obvious, great potential, but that potential is still somewhat undefined, 
right? I think there's been a lot of uh, things thrown at the wall to see what sticks. And that's great because experimentation is good. But one of the things that I think there, there has been lacking on the Air Force side as well is uh, the development of these new guiding doctrinal frameworks. And why are they important? Well, let's look at the past a little bit. You know, in World War I, we had the first tanks appear, right? In World War I, they were just slotted into existing methods. Armored maneuver warfare doctrine that basically said, you know, we're using tanks the wrong way. We should grasp what they do fundamentally well and build our TTPs, our tactics, our procedures around what they do fundamentally well and, and, and then build the technologies, the next generation to really capitalize on what we need them to do, not just to, you know, take them as they are. And that is what resulted in mechanized warfare that provided tremendous overmatch to those who had mastered it in, uh, in World War II. Similarly, adding a few airplanes, uh, you know, they were better than observation balloons, but at the time their, you know, their, their uh, ability to influence the battle was really uh, marginal. And it was only after the war, uh, World War I ended that the theorists of air power doctrine said, well, what are these airplanes, what can they really do for us other than just serve as a great observation platform? Um, and we realized that they could allow you to take the fight into your enemy's strategic centers of gravity without having bomber that could uh, defend itself and fly all the way into enemy territory. And basically the B-17 was pretty much an exact uh, implementation of what the theorists had envisioned as a battle plane. And then as a result of that, we had modern combat aviation, right? But that framework allowed all the pieces to be painted in to create that real overwhelming capability that continued to develop up through the Gulf War and beyond. So are we in an analogous place today, right? We have early autonomous systems uh, uh, and robotics such as that. That's a JTARS uh, kind of heavy uh, resupply drone there. But where is the doctrinal framework that's going to say, how do we take these early examples that we have today, like the Wright Flyers or the Mark I tanks that we have, that we're experimenting with today and translate those into the fundamentally overmatching capability that's analogous to the transition to mechanized warfare, to the transition to air power. And so uh, just as a, a um, John Antos. So one of the things that, that uh, these emerging capabilities may let us to do is basically define a new regime of ground maneuver. And we like to we're calling out the atmospheric uh, littoral. You start to see that term being used more and more often. There was a defense news article last week that was using it as well. So um, uh, some of the ideas here were put forth in a joint force quarterly paper a few years ago that goes into things in more detail. We don't have too much time to, to go into all the details, but I'll be interested in hearing questions. But in a nutshell, if you look at the, uh, the environment, the physical environment of future combat, especially in an urban environment like this one, this is actually a, a battle space in Syria. The, the terrain is extremely unfriendly uh, for any kind of movement, particularly of robotic systems. But if you're talking about something autonomous moving through that environment on the ground, it is very difficult, right? Even for, you know, any kind of other uh, manned vehicle, that's a very... Uh, has always been a fundamental limitation on ground warfare. But as we've seen in the last few years, you're starting to have uh, heavy drones of the type, you know, uh, and uh, John Antall uh, leaned into this a little bit, that have the capability to basically serve as platforms for ground combat that don't actually sit on the ground anymore, right? Because if you move the, the layer, uh, the level of movement, say only 10 meters up, all those terrain impediments are gone. And you can move without, you know, with high speed and high mobility uh, in any direction, almost unhindered. And uh, with the ability to, to, to leverage the, what's emerging in terms of um, some of the drone technologies that advance today, you also have the ability 
to actually to move to a very very low level of altitude you don't have to conduct your uh, air operations if you will up in the blue sky you can do it in what you might think of as the air between the buildings right where you're almost operating on the ground as in close and intimate contact new types of maneuver units that can seize, if you will, uh, the new high terrain, the new key terrain of what of the atmospheric littoral. And if you think about that in the broad sense, that opens a whole new world of tactical maneuver possibilities to the ground force commander. Okay. Um, the lives, the, they can hear the audio on our oh, is the audio not working? Uh, not quite. Okay, I think we fixed fixed the audio. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at what uh, some of the characteristics of this new uh, operational regime might be. So, you know, instead of having a an arbitrary height cutoff or something like that, that really is is quite arbitrary. The atmospheric littoral is really defined in tactical terms. We're talking about it as a military dome, a military operating regime. And that's really three things that define it. One is that it's high enough that the terrain is no longer of any ped impediment, right? In a lot of cases, that's maybe all the way down to 10 meters or, 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 or that low. But it's also uh, low enough that those forces remain in intimate contact with ground forces. You're not talking about traditional air power flying over... Within the ground, uh, within the ground uh, portfolio, but also low enough to use buildings, large trees, and so on as cover and concealment. And why is that important? You know, uh, uh, that middle altitude dimension uh, right now, as we see on the Nagorno-Karabakh and whatnot, is 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 capable of of being exploited very well. Uh, and I think in the future, near very near future, you know, we're going to see that those middle altitudes from a few hundred to a few thousand feet are right in the wheelhouse of shore ad air defense systems. And, and those are improving rapidly, and especially as directed energy weapons start coming on board. Uh, there's going to be a bit of a splitting. And you know, I think you're seeing this tactically already. As some of these quotes from, uh, you know, uh, from um, uh, Mosul and Raqqa and places like this where some of these very early encounters with uh, armed, small, uh, low altitude drones have been seen, that even if though there was total air supremacy on the Allied side, that did nothing to help with the, the battle in the atmospheric littoral, if you will. You're going to have that, that blue sky battle where stealth and precision uh, continue to be uh, dominating factors. And, you know, the Air Force uh, sees that as its domain. But then you're going to have the atmospheric littoral at that low altitude uh, in in this big contact with ground, where I think the uh, the army is really going to be the the primary driver. And let's look at those inherent capabilities, right? So, what are the things that, if you were looking at this like through the same lens that, you, that earlier theorists might have looked at the first airplanes or the first tanks, what are the things that are fundamentally new, right? Three axis maneuverability. These types of platforms can move in any axis with equal speed or remain stationary, right? That's something that was never possible before, but it provides vastly superior mobility to any other ground platform that actually has to move over the surface, uh, particularly when you have a, a really a, a non-amenable environment like an urban space. Uh, relatively compact size, much smaller than helicopters and other things of the past. You know, very small UAS, but uh, to provide that endurance, to provide all weather operations, and to be able to provide the ability to carry uh, at least infantry class weapons, small ATGMs and others. Uh, you know, some of the, the weapons that were used in Nagorno-Karabakh there were like MAM-T and MAM-C, uh, precision guided glide bombs and so forth. Those are all things that weigh about 20 pounds. 
right? So, but that precision allows you to get a lot of lethality out of a small weapon and the ability to carry several hundred pounds like a JTARS class uh, drone does gives you the ability to bring significant lethality to the, com to the uh, uh, and, and combat power. And then uh, also the ability to, to offer that control and autonomy uh, not just to have a single controller controlling a single drone, but to have a single controller controlling a whole, say, swarm of drones really is a breakthrough uh, that's, that uh, needs to be exploited as well. So I think looking ahead, we're moving uh, to you look at what the... So that's uh, also a remarkable power. And then when you aggregate that many uh, units together, that many platforms, each of which is an almost ideal deployment platform for things like ATGMs and whatnot, you can really mass significant combat power uh, in a really flexible and unique way. So let's look at, at the advantage that that would give to one side in ground combat. No? So think of that again. Think of it in the abstract as a maneuver element that is completely immune to terrain, can move at arbitrary speed in any direction, has positional advantage, in all cases, it is occupying key terrain that is, uh, uh, you know, in an ideal position to rain down precision fires and to sustain that position. Ha also has superior situational awareness. We all know that drones provide uh, an excellent ISR platform, and that's intimately integrated into the formation. So that brings a lot of those advantages of ground of air maneuver, such as an ideal unit for use in implementing swarm tactics. You know, we, there's been a lot of excitement about swarming as a tactic since around 2000, but the challenge is that there needs to be a unit that allows you to do that. Uh, currently today, you know, what you ultimately need is a, uh, a unit that has fundamentally greater ability to engage, disengage at will, and create that kind of pulsing uh, uh, swarming by fires or forming swarming by force. And this is a way to provide that fundamental capability in a way that would allow you to actually get after those swarming tactics uh, in a fundamentally uh, robust way. And one of the other things that's really important about this is that it does not require us to basically, uh, you know, junk all of our existing systems and start over with a clean sheet of paper, because these kinds of uh, arrays, if you will, would be complementary to current and emerging capabilities. They're very complementary to precision guided weapons, lower your ring munitions, such as we've just uh, been hearing. Uh, a combat um, capability multiplier in a small way that would allow us to, to actually build our way to the future without having to say, I believe right up front. So there are a lot of remaining challenges. Some of those uh, are listed here. Um, uh, I think, you know, uh, some of these are gone into more details and some of the other uh, literature that we don't have time to, but I'm glad to, to take uh, questions about them. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we want to emphasize that what we, the way to get after this is but that integrated, that iterative approach. And I think you're going to hear in a couple of minutes about some of the, the programs here in the Maneuver Center that are exploring this space and pointing the way forward to find those optimum solutions. So let me just uh, uh, wrap up with one example of tactical utility. This is just one I picked because everybody already knows the background, the Battle of Mogadishu, right, in 1993. So uh, two Blackhawks were shot down during an air assault raid over heavy, heavily populated area of Mogadishu. Raqqa and so forth, who had to try to pull back to friendly lines. <clears throat> the thing that happened in this case is that uh, that terrain uh, was so uh, difficult to deal with, it was full of enemy fighters, and it took 10 hours for a relief column to get from Task Force Ranger at the airport there, one mile to the crash site, right? 10 hours that, you know, made for a thrilling movie, but it's not something that you want to have to do over and over again. If there was just one array of, of, uh, uh, of drones in an atmospheric littoral maneuver force like this that was attached to Task Force Ranger, they could have been over that crash site in 90 seconds and provide sustained overwatch uh, with precision fires, 
uh, sensor and shooter capabilities and so forth that would have revolutionized that entire operation. And in fact, you know, if that had if that capability had been present, it probably would have changed the whole way they went into the fight uh, in general. So, um, you know, and that's just one example uh, from history of how things could have been tremendously different with even. key to how we get there from here, right? Just like we did in the 20s uh, and in other eras, we need to go back to that idea of, of let's put these future concepts uh, at the forefront of our thinking, develop the frameworks as they as uh, empirical results, experimentation uh, take us and follow where they lead us because new doctrine and enabling technology really fit together. They are a cycle that reinforces each other the new doctrine helps lead the technology and the technology helps lead the doctrine and getting that cycle of experimentation going is what allows us to uh, to really get back to where we are determining the future again instead of some of our adversaries. And uh, uh, and we can embrace that incremental learn as we go approach again, um, uh, which is the way to rapidly iterate our way into the future and and skate to where the uh, the puck is going once again as Wayne Gretzky like to say right let's go to where the future is has not yet developed and let's determine save the audience those virtually and and those physically in the room from any slides. So take a deep breath. You've been watching slides all day and, and, and think for a little bit. So, so I'm gonna hit you with a couple things here. So today, the first, the first thing we heard from the chairman was the changing character of war. So how have we changed? And, and I'll come back and tell you the nods were invented by the Germans in 42. As an infantryman, I've watched us do the same maneuver for the 36 years I've been in the army. Yeah, I can do it at night better because I got white phosphorus rather than green phosphorus, but it's the same. If modernization is just changing caliber, then we're not really modernizing. We've always had effective tools. Uh, I would argue that how do we change the tools that we use? So to tie in the prior briefs, John Antal, Colonel Retired, talked about, hey, this recently just happened. Are you aware of it? And what are you doing about it? And then we got George Doherty coming in from the Air Force going, hey, there's this space out there that you have to be concerned about. What do you think? It wasn't armed, but it did its job. The only means I had as a task force guy to take it down was my own M4. So limited in what we could and couldn't do. So how are we changing understanding this dynamic? What I'll give you right now is that the, the so-called democratization of technology has diminished the monopoly of advanced countries and tools of war. In 91, everybody watched us fight Saddam. Cool tools, kill TV. And then we took that for the next 30 years, I'll call it the cruise missile diplomacy of the 90s, into the GWAT, where we were taking tactical outcomes and making them strategic decisions. So what have we done for the warfighter? So how does your squad and your force fight differently? How does your platoon, how does your company fight differently? And how can we make that? And what are we doing about it here in the Maneuver Center seated? I'll, I'll throw a couple things to think about, then I'll talk about exactly how we're trying to get after this. and how we use that technology in our army. Kind of real. So all this technology is out there. We, we're bringing it into the force, but are we really bringing it into the force? Are we still using the same old systems? One. Two is we got this thing, this, this archaic industrial age thing that I'll call the acquisition process, and I'll be honest about it, having served in the CFT. We buy weapons that have less to do with battlefield realities and our own un un unending faith that advanced technology will ensure victory. And that the economic interests and political influence of contractors will be the first and foremost that we address. Our adversaries are not always going to be inferior, and they don't necessarily need to be state actors either. And we're seeing that on the battlefield now. What are we doing about it? One of the things that we've offered and what we've developed here through uh, Mr. Sando at the CDID is a 10x project. 
And it's been in the works for a numerous years by, by one of our lead deputies in the robotics uh, development team in, in Ted Machuba. do with the edge force because that's where the gap is the gap isn't with the predator the gap isn't with what we utilize xcast for the gap is the edge force so what are we getting them to change so we're getting new equipment we're modernizing our network as, as best as we can for tactical networks so we have the ability to modernize that edge capability in robotics robots and autonomous systems allow us to reduce the risk to our warfighters so, so one of the things we talk about, and as our team works with both PO Soldier, uh, PO GCS, uh, Network uh, CFT, Network uh, NGCV, we are, we are a team of teams down here working with about everybody that we can. Because robotics isn't just a solve all because there's this whole swap issue that comes with robotics. I, 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 as, I, as I talk about how we, we reduce that risk to warfighters, one of the things that we've talked about with, with General Kaufman's team is the ability Twenty thirty, and if it's the Army of twenty thirty, and we were looking at MDO capable, we were talking that a few weeks ago as we kind of changed. Is how do we see that? Are we good enough, and can we change enough to get to that point where we have sensor, metal, human? Or are we going to continue to go? Now nah, this is kind of how we fight, because part of our problem and change is our own culture. The other problem is going to be prioritization of money and funding. Unmanned systems are available in military planners because they allow operations over greater distances compared to echelon. So you're in a, you're in an OP and Overwatch. You're a sniper team, and you have the ability to put out a small drone. That small drone perhaps is armed with one shot. In your OP, you don't have to take the shot and give away your OP. You have it. You have that drone take the shot. The shot takes someone out of the fight, but not just one person who's hit. Whoever's got a casvac, them. The alert process. The RF signature starts to grow. That's something we don't do now. The SRR will be coming out soon. So we're working through that right now. But we're looking at a myriad of, of echelonment of capability that we can get out two soldiers on the ground to go ahead and fight within that atmospheric littoral that George described. And it's not just creating the awareness, it's gonna be how do we get just from an ISR platform, how do I get to the armament piece? And what that builds is what we've done with 10X. And with 10X, what we're gonna do this year, utilizing one of our marquee exercises here with AWE and our battle lab partners is gonna be go ahead and work through that, both ground and air robotic systems. From Red Cloud range, can I arm that system, provide security to a force? Can I launch a JTARS with drones on it? to red crowd range, this guy about three clicks away, and then can I engage a hostile force with standoff? So right now, non-state actors can do that, and the United States Army can. With assets that... To extend that battle space, and do an assigned task, or perhaps do a task more efficiently than someone on the ground. So John and Tall talked about the, you know, the dimensional space, or the, if you call it the dimensional chess game that you play, can we do that? So we've been able to do it in the GWAT at really the operational strategic levels of war. And we could pass the feeds down to the tactical level, but not the decision. In 2028 or 2030, can a squad leader in the 101st make a decision to call a strike using a bot in a 40 millimeter round? The answer should be yes. And, and we should be able to build to that piece. That should be our aim point as we move forward. And we create that zone to give that force and give that edge force the ability to do that. We're increasing the technology right now. There's some things we gotta work out with both size, weight, and power. I think every leader understands that. But the ability to 
it's not really neat, but it's different than you had before. And then the feedback we get, we iterate and we go to increment two. With increment two, we look at the ability to build possibly CUAS, possibly the C2 node, because forever we've gone with what? Command posts that every one of us did internally because they're not mtoed. But now we're gonna have data flows that come back from the edge force that overwhelm HCP because the first place you have a staff is a battalion or squadron. So how do we see that? And, and one of the things that I throw out is everybody tells me AI is a trick and Ted will tell me AI is the glue. It's ASUM, Rob. You need to understand that it's, it's artificial intelligence for small unit maneuver. And I agree with them. But if you're not building the analytics now, you're already behind the curveball. We've got to start building those analytics now to get there. That's what we're going to try to do with 10X this year. We're going to try to build in some of the programs into PC22. We're going to make this an annual event down here at the Maneuver Center. We are taking 10X. kind of gone over time, but I think that's an important part to go this. So swarms, and I'm going to talk real quickly about how I think about this. So the, the, the forms of maneuver I kind of hit already. Can robotics be a form of maneuver? So what's a swarm? Is it infiltration? Is it a penetration? I mean, we called what the penetration force. That was a recent one we did with rearm. I kind of go, isn't that just a form of maneuver, but we're making a division of penetration force. So what can robotics be for the army? And how does it change maneuver? And how do we see that change on the battlefield? And don't start from the core and work your way down in the sense of the tactical fight. Take yourself from the squad and walk yourself back. Where does that do? General Carilla and the other cores are going to have their ability to run and do AI. They're going to be able to converge systems. They're going to be able to put pictures together. What is a company commander going to be able to do in 2030? And if we can... I'll stand by for any questions. Not that you need, not that you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, and not the center of gravity shoot you. It was an interesting thing when you had both the center of gravity and the keep the decisive terrain the same. But I also think, John, some of that is we're getting to that. So, JC, I'd come back and go, so, so RF obfuscation, some of the technologies we're looking at is how do I, you know, one of the things that I, I, I'll talk about is how do you, you know, the needle in the haystack, but I want to be needles and needles. I think one of the things we got to look like is an M1 tank looks like a CP that looks like a squad that looks like this. If I can mask myself that way, so in a spectrum, that's what they see. I think that's success. I don't have to mask if I can own the decisive terrain and confuse and deceive their sensors like, like John talks about. Maybe I don't have to mask as much as I think if I can own the ATL. Well, here's what I was going to finish with, which is, which is going to reinforce your point. So if you give me a minute. Sure. Okay. So. They, they won most of the Zona Curabon, but they had to take engineering guided missiles and stuff. And they, they came in from the from the south, from the from the west, and from the east. They climbed 90 foot cliffs in some cases to infiltrate into the city, and they showed up one one morning controlling the key aspects of the city, and the Armenians collapsed. And the slaughter then came into pursuit and was just uh, it was game over. It was a more to it than this, but that's relatively what happened. So my point is, is that they used infiltration as a masking technique, you see, to hide from ISR and from other being and being able to be to be hit by their fire by the uh, by their fire system, by the Armenian fire system. And sometimes they were attacked. There are there are, are there are Armenian videos of uh, Armenian ISR seeing the infiltrators coming in. And artillery launching at them, but it didn't stop them. It wasn't enough. Right. So that's that's. It's interesting how you can use tactics. Spectrum of things that robots could do to help you mask. If you create on the battlefield nothing but false positives. They don't know what to strike. If they start striking all of them, most of the time they're hitting nothing. That's why I ask the question, how many decoys do you put out routinely in your SOP? And the answer is zero. And they say, we don't have any decoys. You make decoys. You can create decoys. You know, you can do all sorts of things to create decoys. You know, or we could create robotic decoys. Yep. 
There's a, and, and we can create robotic smoke systems that, that put out multispectral smoke. And we can put out robotic systems that look like brigade tops that are running around like wind-up toys on the battlefield, and suddenly the enemy's going, wow, kill that top, and there's nobody there. It's just one little system. So there's once we embrace the idea of masking, then you can have a whole series of robots that can actually mask. So what really counts is the vision. against uh, Russian, Chinese, or you know, blah, blah, blah guys, and have them do that and see how many loitering munitions it takes to hold them off for 10 hours or whatever it would take. I mean, we can do all that. We have all the simulation. We never use it. I mean, BBS-3 and BBS-4 is something we can put UAVs in and we should be training with right now. And when I ask people if they're doing it, they say, no. <laughs> so if you want to test a good, if you want to, if you want a hard case to sell your product, Okay, create a visualization, show them how it works. Now the other thing is, is that the whole series of ground robots we've got to have for aerial denial. There's absolutely no reason we should not create a whole robotic plan around being a hedgehog, being a, being a porcupine. I mean, create a system that we could send to Taiwan, that we could send to our, you know, we're sending anti-tank guided missiles to uh, to uh, uh, Ukraine. Big deal. There's Russia. Just imagine what they could do with that. You don't need an airfield for it. Same thing for Taiwan. If your airfields are destroyed, you can keep your loading munition units in your cave. You bring them out, and now when they come to the beach, <laughs> they're in trouble. You've got the ability to do this. But we could have ground systems that could have top attack mines on them. So imagine the spider and all these other top attack mine systems that have been created that have moved on robotic systems, flatten out, lay there. Wait for the time, and then when the enemy tanks come, they pop up, top attack, destroy all the tanks. I mean, we need to be able to deny that ground with those robotic systems. So if we started to fly into Taiwan or these other places, robots, well, does that mean we're at war? Hey, hybrid warfare. Think about this. So great zone. I mean, think about all the things we could get away with. We're the robotic experts of the world, right? We should be able to do this. Give them a porcupine cave. Any other questions? Yeah, the uh, the moderators here are telling us that we have to uh, make room for the next session. So uh, I, you know, I will definitely be here for the rest of the day and tomorrow. So please feel free to, to come up with me with any uh, other questions you have. I think uh, same, same here. Thanks, Thanks. Good job, Bruce.